This is the August 24th, 2022 Land Use Commission meeting. This is a hybrid meeting which is being held at the Airport Conference Center in Hawaiian Airlines Terminal Building at 400 Rogers Boulevard, 7th floor, IIT Suite 700, room number one. It's open to the public and also by interactive conference technology, which links the video conference participants and the other interested individuals of the public via Zoom. To comply, all this is to comply with state law. Members of the public are able to attend in person or view the meeting via Zoom webinar platform. For all meeting participants, I would like to stress to everyone the importance of speaking slowly, clearly, directly into your microphone. And before speaking, please state your name and identify yourself for the record. Also, please be aware that all meeting participants are being recorded on the digital record of this Zoom meeting. Your continued participation is your implied consent to be part of the public record of this event. If you do not wish to be part of the public record, you should exit the meeting now. The Zoom conferencing technology allows the parties and each part participating commissioner individual remote access to the meeting proceedings via their personal digital devices. So please note that due to matters entirely outside of our control, occasional disruptions to connectivity may occur for one or more members of the meeting at any given time. If such disruptions occur, please let us know and be patient as we try to restore the audiovisual signals to effectively conduct business. For members of the public that are wishing to testify during the public witness portions of the meeting and who are accessing this meeting by telephone rather than by, rather than by smartphone or desktop software, you'll need to use the star nine to virtually raise your hand and the star nine to virtually lower your hand. You should also use the star six function to mute and the star six to unmute. I will also share with all participants that we will be taking breaks from time to time, approximately once per hour. And depending on the length of our meeting today, we will also take a lunch break. My name is Dan Giovanni, and I have the pleasure to serve as the chairman of the Land Use Commission. I am attending the meeting today by Zoom conferencing technology. We have nine uh, seated commissioners currently. Attending in the conference room are Commissioner Don Chang, Commissioner Nancy Cabral, Commissioner Kuiki Kamakea Ohelo, Commissioner Gary Okuda, Commissioner Lee Ohigashi, and Commissioner Michael Yamani. Two uh, commissioners are excused today, Commissioner Melvin Cahele and Commissioner George Atta, who has recused himself from the meeting. Also attending from the staff are the LUC Executive Officer, Daniel Orendanker, LUC Chief Planner, Scott Derrickson, LUC Staff Planner, Riley Hakoda, LUC Staff Planner, Martina Segura, and LUC Chief Clerk Ariana Kwan. Representing the Attorney General's Office is LUC Attorney General Dan Morris. Court reporting transcripts are being done from the Zoom recording of this meeting. In accordance with Chapter 92-3 HRS, the LUC will allow for public testimony before and after deliberation on major agenda items. That's two times. Our first order of business is the adoption of the minutes from our meetings of July 26 and 27, 2022. Ms. Kwan, has there been any written testimony submitted on the matter of the minutes for July 26 and 27? Uh, 
No chair. Did you say your name? Who said that? Was that Miss Kwan? Oh, yes. Yes, chair. Thank you. Or uh, I will need assistance from those of you on the on the LUC staff to help me recognize uh, members in the audience and the fellow commissioners who may be raising their hand and I need to call upon. So are you seeing any members of the public <laughs> to testify on the adoption of the minutes? Please let me know. No, I'm not sure. <laughs> You do not see any. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this is uh, Commissioner Cabral, and I'd like to make a motion to adopt the minutes as presented by the staff. Second. Who seconded the motion? Me. Commissioner o. <laughs> Me. Who okay. said me? Commissioner It's me. <laughs> okay, thank you. A motion has been made by Commissioner uh, Cabral and seconded by Commissioner Me to adopt the July 26 and 27, 22 minutes. All in the favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the minutes are adopted. <clears throat> Thank you. Next agenda item is the tentative meeting schedule. Mr. Orndanker, will you please? present the tentative schedule to the commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On September 7th, we will be at UH uh, Hilo in Hilo, in Hilo, Hawaii for the Yamada and Sun special permit matter. On uh, September 14th, 15th, and 16th, the commissioners in their various capacities will be attending the HCPO conference on Kauai. On September 21st, we will again be in Hilo for potential adoption of order on the Yamada and Sun special permit matter. On October 5th, we will be on Maui for the Pu'unene Quarry matter. And on October 6th, we will also be on Maui for the Waikapu Properties matter. On Wednesday, um, October 19th, we will be again on uh, Maui, poss uh, possibly on Maui or um, virtually for the adoption of or both the Punene Quarry matter and the Waikapu property matter. <clears throat> In November, on November 2nd, uh, we, we are looking at being in for the UH at UH Hilo for the U of N Ben Court matter. Or I mean, not Kona. Uh, we're looking at being at UH Hilo for the U of N Ben Court matter. On uh, November 16th, we will again be on Maui for the Puama Lanai Miki Basin matter. Uh, December is currently open. However, we are expecting a 201H project, perhaps, uh, and a another special permit to commence. So we would caution the commissioners to leave those dates open. And that brings us through the end of the year. Thank you, Mr. Ondanker. Commissioners, do you have any questions on the tentative uh, meeting uh, calendar? Seeing and hearing none, we'll move forward. Thank you, Mr. Ondanker. So our fourth order of business is a status and progress report and action, if necessary, for docket A17-804, Hawaiian Memorial Life Plan Limited. Will the parties please identify themselves for the record? Good morning, Curtis Tapata for petitioner. Good morning, Deputy Attorney General Brian Yee on behalf of the Office of Planning and Sustainable Development. With me is Lorene Maki from the Office of Planning and Sustainable Development. Good morning, this is Grant Yoshimori and with me is Rich McCree. We are interviewing for the matter. Mr. Chair, the county has is not present. Oh, they are, they're online, I'm sorry. 
I don't see them on the screen. Who are you looking for, Mr. Rundanker? Uh, the city and county of Honolulu. We're trying to promote them on that so that they'll be uh, present on the screen. There we go. Oh, good morning. Um, this is Dina Wong with City and County of Honolulu, Department of Planning and Permitting. Thank you, Ms. Wong. So, Mr. Orendanker, it was unclear to me on the Zoom who was who introduced themselves following Mr. Yi. Uh, intervener, uh, would you like to restate your presence for the? This is Grant Yoshimori, and with me is Rich McCready with the uh, intervener's pro se. Thank you, Mr. Yoshi Murray. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Let me update the record on this docket. On September 23, 2020, the commission heard the petitioner's closing arguments virtual conference via virtual conference technology and the Zoom webinar platform. Thereafter, a motion was passed to grant the petitioner's district boundary amendment petition subject to conditions. On Thursday, October 8th, 2020, the order was adopted amending the conservation land use boundary, use district boundary to the urban district for approximately 53.449 acres. Between October 8th, 2020, on August 15th, 2022, the commission received a notice of imposition of conditions and the 2021 annual report was received October 13th, 2021. On Friday, August 12th, 2022, the commission mailed out the August 24th, 2022 notice of agenda to the parties to the statewide, to statewide and Oahu regular and email lists requesting that the petitioner appear at this hearing to provide a status report on the progress of meeting the conditions that are set forth in the decision and order. Let me briefly explain our procedure. First, I will recognize the written public testimony that has been submitted in this matter, identifying the person or organizations who has submitted the testimony. Next, I will call for members of the public who wish to testify on the Hawaiian Memorial Life Plan Limited status and progress report. All such indiv individuals will be called in turn by the chair. If testifiers wish to testify virtually, we'll enable their audio and video to our virtual witness box where they will be sworn in. If a witness chooses to testify in person, I will ask them to come forward to the witness box and provide testimony. Members of the public will have two minutes to provide their testimony and should stand by after their testimony to respond to any questions by the parties or the commissioners, that any questions they may have. When all questions have been completed, the chair will excuse the witness and, if virtual, put them back into the viewing audience and call for the next witness to enter the virtual witness box or the in-person witness box. After completion of the public testimony portion of the proceedings, the chair would like the petitioner to provide its status report. Fourth, the chair will then call on the city and county of Honolulu's planning department, office of planning and sustainable development, and the intervener, Hui Opi Koiola, for comments regarding the status report. The petitioner will then be allowed to respond to comments made by the county, OPSD, and the intervener. The commissioners will ask questions of the parties at the conclusion of their presentations. At the conclusion of the party's testimony and commissioner's questions, 
the public will again be granted the opportunity to provide public testimony in the same manner that was set forth earlier. The chair will also note for the parties and the public that from time to time, I will be calling short breaks. Are there any questions by the parties or the commissioners on our procedure today? Commissioner has no questions. OPSD has no questions. And Sudan County has no questions. Sorry, I apologize for that. Uh, interveners have no questions. Thank Mr. you. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. This is uh, Commissioner Chang. I'd like to make a disclosure at this time. Your timing is excellent. I was just going to call for disclosures, if any. Commissioner Chang, please proceed. Thank you very much. Um, I do want to disclose that about two weeks ago, um, we buried, or we had a funeral service for my husband at Hawaii Memorial Park and they were very helpful. But I don't believe if any action is to be taken that their assistance in any way would affect my ability to be objective in this matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any uh, comment or objection to Commissioner Chang proceeding on this document, in this proceeding? Commissioner, no objection. OPSD has no objection. OPSD has Ms. Ms. Wong, could you restate, please? I think. Oh, yes, the county has no objection. Thank you. Interveners have no objection. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Chang, please uh, continue with us without objection. All right, any other commissioners have any disclosures to make at this time? Yes, Mr. Chair. This is uh, Commissioner Kamakel Ohalo. Please proceed. I'd like to disclose that uh, for several years now, uh, I have been friends with the Ohana McCready, uh, who sit our presence today as interveners um, because of their support for our Waimanalo community and our efforts to preserve um, our cultural sites in Waimanalo. Um, and with that dis disclosure, I want to also acknowledge my grandma, who is here present today, Alice Hewitt, who was interviewed um, in the, consult the consultation as a resident as well as a cultural practitioner. Uh, with that being said, I'll finish um, my time here with acknowledging that although I recognize these relationships, I believe that they will not affect my ability to participate in today's hearing as well as uh, proceed with uh, an unbiased opinion. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Kamakea Ohelo. Do any of the parties have an objection or questions at this time regarding the disclosure? Petitioner has no objection. State? OPSD has no objection. County? No objection. Intervener? Interveners have no objection. Very well. So we will, uh, Commissioner Kamakea Ohelo, please proceed without objection to participate in this matter. Any other disclosures by members of the commission? Hearing none, we'll proceed. Um, <clears throat> we'll start with the public testimony. This is on the current subject uh, that we're talking about in this hearing, which is the <clears throat> matter of Hawaiian Memorial. For members of the public, again, please be reminded that commission, the commission will not be considering the merits of this petition. Rather, the commission is interested in learning about the current state of the activities related to the docket, including compliance with conditions, and will consider whether action is necessary. I will now recognize written public testimony submitted in this matter, identifying the person and organizations who have submitted the testimony. Ms. Kwan, has there been any written testimony submitted on this matter? Hi, Mr. Chair. Um, we received four organizations on August 22nd. That was Hawaii Laborers, 
Hawaii Operation Engineers Industry Stabilization Fund, Pacific Resource Partnership, Hawaii Regional Council of Carpenters. And on August 23rd, we received one organization submittal for Hawaii Laborers Union. That is all. Thank you, Ms. Kwan. Can you confirm that those written testimonies have been posted to the LUC website? They are on the website under public comments for the status report for 2022. Thank you very much. Next, I will call for any members of the public to provide testimony on the agenda item. First, I will ask if there are any members of the public present in the room there who would like to testify, and then I will ask for those in the public who may wish to testify virtually by raising their hand using star nine and star six to unmute their Zoom feature. Ms. Kwan, is anyone signed up to testify in person? Hi, Mr. Chair. Nobody signed up at this time. Thank you. Are there, Ms. Kwan, are there any public witnesses who wish to testify virtually by Zoom or by their phone? I don't see anyone raising their hands, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Tabata, the petitioner, will you please provide your status report? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to try and be efficient and address questions that have been raised so far. Um, and then afterward, when the commission commissioners have an opportunity to ask questions, then they can inquire into areas that they may be interested in. Um, so that's my plan. Okay, so. Sounds good to me. Please proceed. Thank you. I'm going to start with the the staff report, the commission staff report uh, that was submitted yesterday, posted on the website. Um, Lee, there's one question raised in the staff report. Um, it has to do with the, the guarantee by SCI, that's um, Services Corporation International, and it stems from a representation made during the hearing. Um, so the representation was that um, that SCI would guarantee the obligations of Hawaiian Memorial Park, um, and that's that includes financial and 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 all other obligations. Um, so um, and so the staff report goes on to cite HRS Section six five six one, which which uh, the staff report says Hawaii law requires a personal guarantee to be in writing and signed by the party making the guarantee. Um, let me start by um, pointing out that, that uh, we have provided um, two documents. Um, one is a letter dated May 1st, 2020. And this is exhibit 57 that we submitted back during the DBA hearing. Um, and this letter made by SCI, um, signed by Sumner J. Warren III. Um, and he said in the letter that SCI recognizes um, the commitments made and SCI uh, is deeply committed, or we are deeply committed to supporting the communities that we serve. As part of this core principle, we want to be clear that this project has and will continue to be, quote, shovel ready, unquote. SCI is financially strong and is absolutely committed to begin construction immediately upon receiving necessary approvals. Okay, we provided that back then um, during the hearing to, to confirm um, our representation that the SCI would stand behind this project. Um, now, upon learning that this status conference was being scheduled um, because of this issue of this guarantee, um, SCI took it upon itself to issue another letter dated August 10th, 2022, um, wherein 
SDI um, provided this letter, and this letter was sent by what uh, is called the Office of the Chairman of SCI. So it's signed by one, two, seven individuals, um, including the Chairman of the Board, Chief Executive Officer, um, and various officers of the of the corporation. Um, we provided this letter and, and a copy of Exhibit 57, the May 1st, 2020 letter as attachments to our letter that I sent on August 16, 2022 to the commission. So you folks should have copies of, this, of these letters. Um, in this August 10th, 2022 letter, um, SCI states that we have been involved in different aspects of Hawaiian Memorial Park proposal to the Land Use Commission, as well as a declaration of conditions that resulted from the proposal. We have committed $25 million for the development, grading, and infrastructure of Hawaiian Memorial Park. This includes the set aside of 100 internment spaces within the cultural preservation area for the benefit of the Ko'olapoko Hawaiian Civic Club to use for traditional Hawaiian burial practices, as well as access to the cultural preservation area and protecting and monitoring the endangered damselfly habitat on cemetery property. Um, this letter is significant because what they're saying is that they've committed and they've set aside $5 million. So this letter goes beyond the guarantee. They have committed the money, it's set aside, it exists. We are not paying for financing. We, we do not have to apply for these funds. The funds are ready to be spent. Um, I, there was a question raised, um, I believe by the intervener in a recent letter that they submitted that our representation was that SCI would, would uh, guarantee the $30 million project, because at the time of the hearing, we estimated the project to be $30 million. I believe that estimate is still accurate. Um, what SCI has already done is, is for this project, they've already spent over $5 million just to get here today. It's, they've incurred and paid for and spent over $5 million uh, on this project. So put, combine that with this $25 million set aside, um, there's your $30 million plus. Um, but if, if this commission wants another set aside, then um, let us know. Um, if there's $5 million more that need to set aside, then, then they can consider the request. Uh, but it's just, this has been set aside, the money is there. Um, I like to make an analogy, so I would say try to picture a mountain of $100 bills stacked to my, my left. They're there, it's there, and it's ready to be spent. Um, there's no contingencies, and there's no ifs. The money is there, it's gonna, and it's gonna be spent um, if we are allowed to continue with this project. Uh, so that covers that as far as, and, and there's fine documents. So if, 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 if people want, are looking for a signed document by SCI, here we have two of them. Um, as far as 656-1 being the basis for requiring some other written agreement, 656-1 um, is, the lawyers refer to as our statute of fraud statute. So this statute says is that certain agreements must be in writing. They cannot be oral. Okay? It has to be reduced to writing and signed by the parties. And it, it, it applies to various scenarios. Um, um, the classic scenarios where a written agreement is required is where you have a contract for land. Um, like say a deed, or if I want to sell land to somebody, it has to be in writing. It cannot be an oral contract, okay? Or if, or if, you do, if we do a contract, it's going to take more than one year to perform. Again, it needs to be in writing, okay? Uh, 
In this situation, I believe um, 656-1 paragraph two is being referred to. Now, what the statute says is that no action shall be brought and maintained in any of the following cases. Paragraph two goes on to say, to charge any person upon any special promise to answer for the debt, default, or misdoings of another. Okay. Now, our position is that this statute is, does not apply to Hawaii Warning, SCI, or this docket in general. Um, there is no debt. There is no debt involved. There's obligations that we must perform under this commission's decision and order, um, our, the conditions, the representations, but there is no debt that we owe to this commission or any party in this proceeding. Um, there is no default. Um, default in this, um, this, so this part of the statute that I just read, I believe refers to um, lenders or borrowers, I should say, um, and, and lessees. So a default would be a default under lease, typically, okay, the failure to pay rent. Um, or lease payments. Misdoings of another, uh, I'm not sure what that means, but perhaps that's some kind of other violation of a lease um, by the lessee, hazardous waste, destruction of uh, property. Um, but none of those things apply to this situation. So what this statute is referring to, or what it applies to is a situation where you have a, lend, a uh, lender and borrower a lessor, lessee. Um, that's not what we're doing here. The Land Use Commission is not a lender. It is not a lessor. It is not a landowner. Um, therefore, we, we believe this statute is, is inapplicable to Hawaii Memorial with respect to this docket. Um, and, uh, and of course, the first our first and primary argument is that we've it's basically performed. They've, uh, they've basically funded this project already, SCI has. Um, and if there's any other obligations, you know, there's the representations made do refer to obligations other than the financial ones. And uh, we've, we've spoken with them, we've, we've contacted them and they said, yes, they, whatever obligations there are, they, they agree with it. They will, they will comply, they will guarantee, they will perform, guarantee any obligations needed. Um, we, should, we should know though that Hawaii Memorial itself has not defaulted, it's not, not default, has not failed to do any of its obligations. Um, if certain obligations have not been completed yet, it's because we haven't had enough time. Um, it's, less, it's been less than two years, uh, as this commission knows. Um, so there is, Right now, Hawaii Memorial is is doing everything it's supposed to be doing as best as it can, given the time that has been passed. So that I believe covers the staff report, the commission staff report. Um, now, the petitioners have, have provided their letters um, and pointed out areas of concern. So let me respond to those. Um, Construction drainage improvements. Um, construction and timetables. Um, we expect to have a clear schedule of when we can expect design approval and development. We have not received any information on the construction and timetables. Um, okay. We did provide a development timetable in our status report on October 13, 2021. And in that timetable, we said, petitioner anticipates that construction plans will be completed by the first quarter of 2022 and permitting will be completed 
by the end of 2022. Development of the project should be completed by the end of 2024. Um, okay. Our construction plans have been delayed. Okay. Um, what we need to do is um, perform borings, geotechnical exploratory borings, um, drill down and take out cores. Um, our, our geotechnical expert, Robin Lim at Geolabs, he'll analyze that. And based upon his, his results, conclusions, our engineers will then take that information and do a final grading plan. Um, and with that information, there would be a detention basin, an detention basin analysis that is also dependent upon those exploratory borings. Um, the problem we ran into is that we did not anticipate that we would need a grading permit to do those borings. To do those borings, equipment has to be sent out. And that equipment is, uh, it's, it's, it's large, it's fairly large. You can't just carry it there, you can't hike it in. You need to basically, you have to truck it in, you have to wheel it in. Um, so they have, to, they have to create a roadway, a dirt road. And this dirt road requires approximately 3.7 acres of grading, okay? Um, so the city and county DPP told us, look, you need a grading permit, but in order to get a grading permit, you, your land use commission conditions requires you to first record your conservation easement and, and provide a tree replacement plan. Now at that time, we weren't anticipating doing or recording the easement or doing a tree replacement plan at that early stage. Um, so we had to then put that on the critical, those two items on the critical path and get them done. Um, and that was a challenge um, and it took time. So, Conservation easement, we recorded that on July 5th, 2022, just, you know, last month. It took that much time. Um, the fact that we had to do the conservation easement before we could do our exploratory borings uh, gave us a challenge. Um, we needed to describe our work in the conservation easement, but we couldn't describe our work until we could do our mass grading plans. And we couldn't do our mass grading plans until we did our exploratory borings, but we needed a grading permit to do the, to the borings. <laughs> okay, so, you know, we were in a chicken and egg situation and it took a while for us to work out language so that the parties would be satisfied and we could execute, finalize the conservation easement. Um, so basically we got pushed back nine months in our schedule. So all of those dead, prior deadlines I mentioned on the, or, you know, projected um, completion dates gets pushed back to the point where originally we thought our project would be completed by the end of 2024, but now we're looking at the third quarter of 2025 to complete the project. Um, so that is our development schedule right now. Um, let me go back to the letter, to be his letter. Okay, community outreach. So community outreach um, is a requirement um, and we need to Let me, go, let me go directly to the condition. Okay, this is condition 15 from uh, this commission's DNO. 
Petitioner shall establish an ongoing construction related community outreach program to inform area residents and businesses of construction milestones and activities occurring on the property. In addition, the petitioner shall establish a hotline and a dedicated email address to for immediate and prompt responses to questions, concerns, or comments from the community and other stakeholders. So what we did was we took our website, hmpfacts.com, and posted in there information relating to our construction schedule, um, the damsel fly, uh, um, and cultural, um, cultural um, facts and updates. And also there's a hotline, there's a telephone number to call, there's an email address to where you could post information or make, you know, make inquiries. Um, so that's, that's been done. And, and we have, okay we, okay, we pulled our grading permit for the trail clearing last week. And it's, that has started, uh, I believe on Monday. Um, uh, so we did update our website so that we have we posted the information regarding that work and giving notice to the public that that work has commenced um so the website has been updated so um there have so there have been decent updates to the website but we believe it's um it's complete as far as what we're what we're supposed to uh, provide um Construction drainage improvements. Uh, again, we, we need to do our borings first. Um, and once we do our borings, we'll, we'll, we'll know what um, the grading requirements will be, what our drainage requirements will be. So the, the detention basin analysis that we're, that we're required to do pursuant to condition five, Condition five is our detention basin analysis. We're approximately 40% done on that. It's a rough estimation. Um, I pestered our engineers until they gave me a percentage of completion, um, but they cannot finish it until we get the borings information. Um, and that borings have started. Um, we're not sure exactly when they can start. We're, we're negotiating a contract right now, um, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be done before the end of the year. Um, hopefully, a lot sooner. I'm trying to be conservative in my estimates, but um, it's going to be done. Hopefully, they're going to start in the month of September. That's what we're hoping. Okay. Construction and timetables. I think I went over that. Okay. Tree replacement plan was done. We had to do that for the, the grading permit for the for the trail clearing to do our borings. Um, so petitioner says DPP noted that petitioner did not specify where the required placement trees would be planted for the already removed existing trees. Um, it's it is a work in progress. What we've done is we've in our plan we've identified potential um, receivers of trees, um, uh, including including the Koalao Foundation and the Koalao Poco um, Hawaiian Civic Club. So you know we're, we're we're dealing with state agencies, other organizations. We're we're at the stage of um, finding people who want trees. Basically, and also we will plant. Of course, we'll plant trees on our own property. Um, so we're at that's the stage we're at. So we don't know exactly who's going to be getting trees right now. We we have to work on that. That's true. Uh, execute a conservation easement and restrictive covenant. So the conservation easement and restrictive covenant, which is one document, uh, we like I said, we we've, we've signed it. June 30th, 2022, and recorded it on 
at the Bureau of Conveyances, July 5th, 2022. So that's done. Um, create a cultural preserve. Um, we've, we've done a management agreement. Um, we call it the MOA. It's, it's pretty short, um, but we did sign it. So um, we signed it, Hawaii Memorial did, along with the Koala Foundation. Um, the Koala Foundation, I believe, is affiliated with the Koala Poco Hawaiian Civic Club. Um, and it's signed. They have their access. Um, but access to the cultural preserve will be provided through Hawaii Memorial. And that access will go to, has to go through the expansion area. So basically we have to finish our expansion area in order to connect to the cultural preserve to provide to provide more accessible access. Not sure how else to put it. Um, access is still it's it's presently available. If, if you if, if people want to basically hike into the cultural preserve, um, if that's possible. But for people who who, who may find the hike a hike difficult, uh, we we need to create um, proper access, um, and that that will be done um, as soon as we can as development progresses. Um, Protect the black line dam supply. Okay, so our dam supply mitigation is ongoing. We have been doing um, our monitoring. So the monitoring has been going on for the past 12 months. Um, and they're monitoring for water level in the well. Let me back up a little bit. So I know we have no new commissioners. So what we have is on on a property, we have dams of fly habitat, a black line dams of fly habitat. Uh, it's an endangered species um, that uh, that uh, we're we are we've agreed to, we require to protect to help preserve. Um, and they exist in what's called a seep. And what it is is what we have we so it's 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 like a little hillside. Okay, so it, it goes it flows it goes downhill. At the top, there's a well. We don't know where it came from. Who, who built it? It's a dug well with a cement um, top. And it's covered right now, um, and it's being monitored. We installed a, a monitoring gauge as required on September 15, 2021, and from this well. Well, in this well is a water level, which we've been monitoring. It's approximately 213 feet mean sea level. It fluctuates um, maybe a couple inches throughout the year. Um, below the sea, below the well is the sea. And what it is, it's a linear body of water um, that goes down about 200 feet and, and exits or drains into a city drainage inlet. <clears throat> okay. Um, so our monitoring includes um, recording the, the water level in the well. It includes the water rate. So about 150 feet below the well, there is what we call a weir or a dam. And it's a it's a it's a mechanism that measures the flow rate of the water. So how much water passes through the weir, we, we monitor that and we measure that. Um, there's, in addition to the, the flow rate, we, we monitor the rainfall. There's a, there's a rainfall gauge that records the rainfall and we monitor for water quality. Um, now, as far as the biota and the habitat goes, we monitor the black line dams of fly for the numbers. You know, they, they try to count the, the dams of fly um, and they look for predators um, like fish, toads, frogs, pigs. Uh, and they, they log every month. They go down, they, they 
you know, they monitor, if, if they find toads, they uh, remove them. Um, no fish, so fish, like mosquito fish, they're the, they're the, the most serious threat to the damsel fly. Um, so, and luck, we haven't seen any fish in there. The reason why the damsel flies are, are able to survive, my understanding is that because there's no fish and there's no fish because this, this linear body of water does not connect to any other body of water, okay? When it drains into the, into the, the city's inlet, it, it, it waterfalls. It doesn't, it doesn't connect to the water in the drainage. I mean, if, if it did connect to the water in the drainage, I mean, I'm sure there's mosquito fish everywhere, right? It's probably down there in the, in the city's drainage system, um, but, but it's a waterfall, so the fish cannot go upstream. You know, and therefore there's no fish in the sea, and the and the damsel fly has been able to survive ever since they've been discovered, which is at least three years. So, so the damsel fly they're being counted; they're still there. Um, and you know, just this month. Our um, Steve Montgomery, our entomologist, and uh, Anita Manning, they both went down and they both uh, observed and counted dams of fly. So all of those factors are monitored and recorded every month. Um, and um, overall, I think the, the overall assessment is so far so good. Um, what else have we done? We've, okay, we've also installed a temporary water line. Um, we, they dug a trench, um, they laid PVC piping, um, connected a hose. So uh, if there's ever a need for additional water, um, we'll turn on the water um, with the guidance of um, Steve Montgomery. Now, okay, the people conducting the monitoring, we have Leslie Davidson and Susan Burr from ACOS, they're biologists. They are recording the, the water flow in the seep, the rainfall, and water quality. Um, Tom Nance is our, our hydrologist, and he's, he's monitoring the water level in the seep. And, um, and Steve Montgomery and Anita Manning, they are monitoring the, 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 the seep uh, habitat, uh, the biota. And, um, so that's being done. Um, I, I believe that answers the questions or the issues raised by the intervener. I mean, oh, so the interveners had a second letter that we, I mentioned. Um, they said there's a discrepancy between our representations of the project's 30 million and the, the SCI's August letter is only 25 million. So I think I spoke about that already, that they already spent 5 million plus. Um, so I believe, They've already basically, yeah, the SCI has already done their 30 million. Um, and I believe that covers everything that's been raised so far. I'll let the commission ask me questions later to follow up on any other um, items they um, want to follow up on. That's, but that's all I have for now, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tabata. Now I'd like to turn to our commissioners. I see the time is currently 10, 10. We've been going for almost an hour. I'm going to recommend we take a, a 10 minute break. And then when we return, we will have uh, questions by the commissioners to the petitioner. So I'm going to call for a break and we will reconvene at uh, 1020. Let's go back on the record. I heard the recording has started. So it's 1020 by my clock. So uh, commissioners, do you have any questions for the petitioner and his pres regarding his presentation today? Or Commissioner Cabral? Uh, yes, I have a, hopefully a simple question in regards to the damselfly, which was most fascinating. 
um, in your, I think in the commitments was to be fenced, putting a fenced area around the, the known area where the damsel fly is, you know, nesting in that. So is, has that fencing been put up or not at this point? But the fencing is not yet complete. Okay. Um, well, we did do the topographic survey, but we still need to consult with Gopha and U.S. Fish and Wildlife to finalize the area to be fenced. And then we need to contract a, a contractor to install the fence. And we may need a building permit because um, it's <clears throat> it has to be a fence capable of keeping pigs out. So it's probably going to be pretty heavy duty. Okay. So that and the area that so in other words, uh, you indicated that you have a water line going down to it to supplement what might naturally be coming. But other than that, the whole area is really not yet disturbed by your roadways or your construction or your um, changes. That's right. Um, so there's there is a buffer area, um, 50 meters or 164, which is 164 feet um, from the top, the sides of the seat, no construction is allowed. Okay, that's that's something that um, is um, there. So there's a whole area um, cannot we cannot have construction um, except we have to build a fence. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for the update. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gabral. Other commissioners who may have a questions? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Yaman. Say again? Uh, Commissioner Yaman. Commissioner Yamani, uh, please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on the question on the warring requirements, the technical warring requirements, was that a requirement that was not anticipated or was the fact that the grading permit was required it was not anticipated that it kind of caused a delay? I believe it was the grading permit that was not anticipated. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, I can't see everyone, so I need a little help if anybody else has a question. Uh, Chair, this is Gary Okuda. Commissioner Okuda, please proceed. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Tabata, thank you very much for your very comprehensive uh, report. Uh, you answered a lot of questions that I was going to ask, especially the uh, fact that the conservation easement has not only been signed off and recorded, so that actually uh, you know, solves uh, or, or eliminates a, a lot of questions that I was asking. Um, I, I would like to ask you a question regarding condition number 11, which deals with the uh, um, management of the cultural preserve and the participation of the Koala Poco uh, Hawaiian Civic Club. Um, tell me if I'm stating part of that condition uh with respect to the uh Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club wrong but uh let me see if uh, I can state it and let me quote petitioner meaning uh Hawaiian Memorial Park your client shall cover reasonable expenses incurred by the group associated with the management of the preserve including rockfall hazard mitigation and liability did I accurately quote the condition uh, that's stated in the DNO, specifically part of condition number 11? I'm reading condition 11. I believe that's accurate. Yeah, and I, I recognize it's not the entire condition. It's one part of the condition. So just so that we are on the same page about what the words mean, uh, the word petitioner really refers or uh, is intended to describe your client, correct? Correct. And the word group, G-R-O-U-P, which is in that uh, condition which says petitioners shall cover reasonable expenses incurred by the group associated with the management of the preserve. 
Is it your understanding the group referred to the Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club? I think that's accurate. Okay. In the memorandum of understanding for MOU that your client has signed with the Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club or its affiliated entity, did that memorandum of understanding make clear to the Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club that the petitioner, your client, has an obligation to co cover the reasonable expenses incurred by the Civic Club or its affiliated entity? And I apologize for having to ask this question because I didn't, you know, I haven't seen the MOU. Um, I, it, it is covered. I know that. Um, we have a... We have a comprehensive provision in the MO, MOA. Um, we're, we're required, we confirm our requirement to comply with all of our uh, obligations, all requirements of the DNO as it pertains to the cultural preserves. So, you know, because we need to cover those expenses, it, yes, they are covered by the petitioner. If you know, either orally or in writing, just so that the understandings are clear, did you or your client specifically explain or tell the Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club that its expenses, its reasonable expenses incurred with managing the cultural preserve would be paid? I, I'm not saying it had to be in words like, hey, just do what you think is necessary reasonably, of course, the expenses would be paid, but you know, kind of words to that effect so that they have an understanding and maybe are put at ease that uh, you know, some of the burdens of cultural preservation, the financial burdens, uh, they're not gonna have to carry out these burdens alone. What was that thought or intent communicated to the civic club? I believe so. I mean, all the work that's going to be required, we're going to do um, the access, um, any maintenance. Um, uh, you know, I, I, but understand that as far as the work that gets done, we have to upgrade, you know, we're going to have to, it'll be at the direction of the Koala Foundation, the Koala Poco Hawaiian Civic Club, and also the Hawaii Islands Land Trust. Um, the conservation easement covers the cultural preserve also. So they're, you know, they're one of our partners. So we have to consult with them. But we're going to pay for everything, do all the work. Um, that's, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's been made clear. Uh, if not, then they're here now and they're, they're hearing it. Yeah. Um, so we, yes, we'll, we'll do all of that. Yeah, because I'll, I'll tell you, and it's just a personal concern. I'm not saying it's shared by any other commissioner or anything like that. But I do believe that one reason why uh, this boundary amendment was approved was because, frankly speaking, the Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club put its reputation behind this project. And so, uh, you know, I just wanna make sure that whatever commitments are being made are, you know, as a practical matter also kept. Can I ask you this? And I'll, I'll tell you, I'll frame the question so you understand where I'm coming from. I, uh, you know, you and I, we've been practicing law for probably the same amount of time. Um, one of my concerns is always unequal, um, not unequal bargaining position, but unequal level of knowledge of the law in uh, things that are being negotiated and put down in writing because what's put down in writing often becomes binding contracts. Was the Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club represented by an attorney in the course of the, uh, the 
preparation or agreement of the memorandum of understanding or memorandum of, of agreement or you know that document we we're talking about did they have an attorney representing them um i don't know um okay the, 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 that's fine the direct communications was uh i wasn't involved uh, but when we did the management agreement um the, the Civic Club provided us a form um, that they were familiar with. Uh, so we used that form and it was very, very convenient because it was short. Um, but I did have to put in a, a provision requiring Hawaiian Memorial to comply with all of the requirements of the DNO. Uh, you know, it, you can call it, you can call it a catch all, but in any event, it's, it's all the requirements. Um, they're in there, um, but yes, to answer your question, I, I'm not sure if they had an attorney to do. Well, do you, would you consider it to be a reasonable expense if in connection with this cultural management uh, uh, area or preserve, or in connection with the Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club or its affiliates, uh, performance or management of the cultural preserve, would your client consider it a reasonable expense for the Hawaiian Civic Club to retain an attorney so it's clear they have independent legal representation and your client pay for it under this provision of condition 11? I mean, like you've already pointed out the requirement that we pay for their expenses. Uh, you know, if, if, if attorney's fees falls into that category, then, then so be it. Yeah, well, I'm asking uh, so that we, we don't have to, you know, go over this in the future. Would you, speaking on behalf of your client, believe that the retention and the cost incurred by the Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club to retain an attorney to advise it regarding the cultural preserve would be considered a reasonable expense for which under condition number 11, uh, Hawaiian Memorial Park should reimburse its costs or pay for those costs. Yeah, we would agree to that. Okay, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, do you anticipate um, any additional agreements that have to be signed or approved with the Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club with respect to um, its role as the manager of the cultural preserve? Uh, there may be uh, well, one other agreement we did sign was a, a separate indemnification agreement where SCI agreed to indemnify the Kola Foundation. Um, so we did that too. So SCI is involved with with, with the, with the cultural preserve, right? Um, yeah. As far as future agreements, it may be you know if if they want um more specific um uh provisions um agreement amendments um we'll we'll we will execute those but i don't i'm not sure what more is needed but if more is needed we will we will execute them it, well it, it very well may not be that more is needed because uh you know, I know you, Mr. Kabata, you, you're a fair person. You do represent your client to the best of your ability. But from what you've described, I can see you're trying to, you know, accurately and in good faith implement all of these things. So I don't want my questions taken, you know, to in, indicate any negative comment about what you're doing. It's not intended that way. May I just ask uh, maybe one last uh, question in, in this area? Would your client object to the Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club at this time retaining an attorney of its own choice to be paid by Hawaiian Memorial Park 
to review the existing agreements that it has with Hawaiian Memorial Park so that the Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club will, you know, have its own independent assurance from competent legal counsel that it has what it needs. And maybe if its own independent attorney tells them or advises them, they might need some additional documentation um, that, you know, that can be accomplished for the Civic Club. Would there be an objection to something like that? No, I wouldn't object to that. I, I, I assume that they would choose their own lawyer. You wouldn't um, presume to choose a lawyer for them. Yeah, and, and, and my question is not so much that you would choose a lawyer for them, but that there would be no objection to Hawaiian Memorial Park reimbursing or paying the cost that the uh, Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club incurs to get this independent representation. Of course, the fees have to be reasonable, right? I mean, you can't retain somebody who's going to charge you a million dollars for this. Okay, so we're talking reasonable fees, yeah. Yes, I believe our 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 confirmation, our confirmation, our response just prior to this question did that. Yes, we we will pay for their lawyers at reasonable attorney's fees to review the, this document or to give other advice as as needed. Um, you know, in your uh, status report on uh, page two, there was reference to a preservation plan. Um, has that preservation plan been prepared? And if not, can you uh, tell us where or what the status is of the preservation plan? Um, we need to work on it. I mean, and, and we're going to need to work with the Civic Club, the Koala Foundation, Hawaiian Islands Land Trust, uh, our own cultural experts. We have not had a chance to finish that. Has the work on the preservation plan even started? As far as I know, no. Okay, and and I don't, again, I don't mean to imply or suggest anything negative. I'm just trying to find out status. Do you have an anticipated date when you think uh, the work uh, on the preservation plan would start? We are prepared to start when all of our partners are prepared to start. This is not something we do. We can do unilaterally. Um, um, the cultural preserve is, is is critical. It is it is important, okay, it, because it's for for all of us involved. Um, and we will do what we need to do when we need to do it, um, unequivocally. I mean, we will do it. Um, but we need to work with our partners, basically. Um, well, um, Mr. Tabata, I'm only asking this question because I believe on page two of your status letter, it said that the preservation plan was estimated to be completed by the end of January, 2022. Did I misunderstand what the estimated completion date was? If that's what it says, then it was optimistic. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I mean, we all know from our decades of practicing law, you know, stuff gets delayed and it's many times delayed without fault of anyone. It, things just happen. Um, it is, can you tell me what, uh, if anything, is preventing uh, the start of the preservation plan to be started, at least to start creating the preservation plan? Is there any real impediment that prevents uh, getting the getting the ball rolling, uh, to use that term, to get the preservation plan done. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I've been corrected. Okay, yeah. the preservation plan has been drafted. Okay. There is a draft in existence, uh, but it, we, they need to incorporate, we need to incorporate um, data from, uh, well, we need to incorporate the data recovery and cultural preserve. We need information from our data recovery, um, 
The data recovery plan has been done. Um, but now they need to work on a data recovery report. Okay. And then um, information from that and the cultural preserve is necessary for the preservation plan. Okay, that makes that makes sense. Thank you very much for that that information. So, with with that information, do you have any anticipated uh, or uh, anticipated date when the plan would be completed, or still uh, it it's maybe a little bit premature to determine a completion date? We expect it to be finalized by the end of the year. Okay. Um, can you explain to what extent you're involving the Kola Hoko Hawaiian Civic Club in uh, the preparation and decision making of what is going to be in the preservation plan? They do need to be consulted. Okay, so have they been consulted at all with respect to the preservation plan? When I say they, I mean the Kola Hoko Hawaiian Civic Club. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, can you have an estimate of when you plan further consultation with them? Is it going to be before or after the completion of these surveys? Or what, what's the plan of action, if you can tell us? September. Oh, okay. Of this year. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, on, on page two of your status report, you also have uh, stated that um, you you confirmed or petitioners confirmed that Native Hawaiian seeds and cuttings propagation will be managed by a Native Hawaiian nonprofit organization that operates nursery specializing in Native Hawaiian plants. Um, can you tell me or identify what uh, organization is going to be involved or is involved with the um, the uh, propagation and the actions with respect to Native Hawaiian seeds and cuttings? That's the Koala Foundation. Oh, okay, great. Thank you very much. And um, can you give us any more background about what is being done with respect to the propagation of Native Hawaiian seeds and cuttings? Pretty sure they're already in the process of securing those. Um, I can get more details about the number of cuttings and the types and put them in our um, annual report, which is due October 13, 2022. So it's coming up. Um, it's probably more efficient. Okay. If yeah. I gather that information for that document. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. You know, um, my uncle who had an orchid farm told me that I'm not fit to be a farmer, but I, I would, you know, I, I'd be interested to know specifically what types of native seeds, cuttings, plants are being considered, uh, you know, with respect to uh, the subject area so that maybe people with more expertise and knowledge uh, can, you know, uh, consider that as far as, uh, you know, the uh, pending pending issues. Um, uh, yeah, Mr. Tabata, uh, thank you very much. You've answered all my questions. Uh, appreciate very much the time you've spent in to in this project and uh, you know for, for all your work that you do in this community. So thank you very much, Mr. Tabata. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No further questions. Thank you, Commissioner Akuda. <clears throat> do any other commissioners have questions for the petitioner? Yes, um, Mr. Chair, this is Commissioner Chang. Please proceed, Commissioner Chang. Thank you. Um, I too, Mr. Tabata, appreciated your uh, presentation. I felt it was responsive to many of the concerns that were raised either by the commission as well as by the interveners. Um, I just want to follow up. I also appreciated the line of questioning by uh, Commissioner Okuda regarding the cultural preserve and the conservation easement. Um, and I know that you tried your very best to answer those questions. 
I also see representatives of the Ko'ala Foundation, the Ko'ala Poka Hawaiian Civic Club, and the Hawaii Land Trust. Um, and Mr. Chair, this may be a little out of order because we were just going to be hearing from the, the actual parties. Um, but I would ask that we actually hear from representatives of the Ko'ala Foundation, the Ko'ala Poka Hawaiian Civic Club, and the Hawaiian Land Trust if they have no objections to at least provide us an update on the discussions. Um, are you satisfied with the, you know, the current negotiations with Hawaii Memorial Park? Are you moving at a speed that you feel comfortable with? Do you feel like you are participating in decision making? Um, so if I may, if, if again, it is out of order, but if you would permit them to, and if they're willing to, so, uh, Commissioner Chang, you know, our, our format does provide for a second round of public testimony following the presentations by the parties. And I would join in you in encouraging those parties that you just named to come forth at the, at the time um, that we in, invite the second round of public testimony today. Would that be adequate for you or are you looking for something more? No, nope, that's fine. I mean, I think they understand the, the kind of questions that I have, and um, there will be an opportunity for them, as well as any other members of the public, to provide testimony. So thank you, you know, very they, much. They will be able to um, make a short their remarks, and then the commissioners could ask them more specific questions to them if they're willing to come forward. Very good. Okay. Commissioners, any other further questions for the petitioner? I don't see any hands raised. Uh, the chair has a couple of questions. So, Mr. Tabata, I would like to add my uh, appreciation to the others for you coming forward today and preparing and your forthright presentation to this commission on the progress that you've been making and the delays that you've encountered. My question in particular is a follow-up to that of Commissioner Yamani, um, having to do with the what is currently labeled a nine-month delay to the project due to the need for geotechnical boring that came apparent once you applied for your grading permits. Um, I hearken back to your annual report of October 13, 2021, which had no mention of this potential uh, delay. Is that correct? Right. I, I don't believe we ever discussed this potential delay. Should I conclude that you didn't know about it at the time of uh, that report? Yes, it was a surprise. Um, it was a very unpleasant surprise uh, because of the difficulty we had in in doing in in writing out and agreeing to our conservation easement, um, it was un unanticipated. So let me uh, encourage you uh, in some detail uh, when you write your next annual report, which you mentioned is due October 13th, 2022, on condition 16 development timetable, that you put a lot more detail in that uh, report regarding the, the 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 detail the the detailed timetable and how the parts uh, will fit together and then i'd like to go to a hypothetical if i may because you made another very fascinating statement today having to do with the co financial commitment of the um, of the owner of Hawaiian memorial and uh, I am concerned that as we proceed from the geotechnical boring, which was not anticipated, to a road that we have to put in for the boring, which was not anticipated, and then leading into a final grading plan, and then leading into the design of the, of the retention basins. And these are pretty large retention basins, I might add, that you won't even have a firm ability to obtain firm firm cost 
uh, estimates or commitments on those aspects of the project until you complete those plans. That's my perspective. Is that re a reasonable expectation that you'll get much more accurate cost estimates once those plans are developed? That is reasonable. So if the statement, the provocative statement that you made was, if it turns out that more than $30 million is needed for this project, and in fact, if more than $25 million needs to be set aside, that this commission should come forth and ask for it. And it probably, and, and then it will be done. Is that, is that what you said to us today? Yes. Or you consider the request, I think you said. So let me encourage you to, uh, once these more detailed plan, once the boring is finally done and these plans are developed and you get a better cost estimate, we are request, I am requesting that you come forth with a more accurate uh, estimate for the total cost of the project so that if, if this commission uh, sees a number which is in excess of $30 million, we'll be in a position to make that request uh, that more, more dollars be set aside. Is that reasonable to you? That sounds reasonable to me. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I don't have any further questions for the petitioner at this time. Um, so I'd like to uh, proceed with the hearing today and ask the county if the county would like to make a presentation on this matter. Well, hello, this is Dina Wong with the county. And we don't have a presentation, but I just had um, one question for Mr. Tabata. So thank you for your um, status um, report. I just wanted to touch upon condition 15, your community outreach. Um, I know you're doing a lot with the website and providing um, a hotline and email address for um, concerned residents to send in comments, but have you folks um, done other type of outreach, um, specifically like going to the neighborhood boards just periodically to give an update, especially as you approach um, milestones like the grading for the um, roadway? Um, we did do a mailer. I'll, we sent out 1,800 letters up back in March, I believe, of this year, um, informing them of the website um, and the information that will be on the website. Um, we have not gone back to the neighborhood boards. That, does that answer the question? Uh, yes, that answers the question. Um, yeah, I did see the mailer on the website from March, but I mean, I think I would just encourage the petitioner to use the neighborhood boards as a venue for getting the word out to the community. Because uh, a lot of folks perhaps are not, maybe not a lot, but there are some uh, residents who may not be connected to the internet and don't have that capabilities and um, get their news in other ways. Thank you. So I don't have any other questions. Um, Franz Cranes from our um, DPP is also here. Franz, did you have any? Thanks, Dina. Uh, good morning, everyone. Franz Cranes with DPP. I, ju I just wanted to- Let me interject for, for a moment. You know, our procedures do not you know, provide for direct questioning of the of the petitioner. But if there's any, and I appreciate that the question was asked and answered and, and, and it just helps clarify the matter. So it worked pretty well. But if you mm -hmm. can, please frame your remarks in the form of, of a statement or presentation. And then if we need clarification, the commissioners can ask for those clarifications that you might be seeking. Okay, thank you, understood. Thanks, Chair. Um, Again, Franz Kranz with DPP. I just want to illuminate a little bit about the grading permit. I, I suppose it was our branch, our division that was responsible for this delay. But we took very seriously the condition, the decision in order language that said none of those, um, none of the grading can occur 
until the conservation easement was recorded, until a landscape plan and tree replacement plan was submitted to the department and approved. So uh, we realized it may have been inconvenient, but again, we took very seriously the, the literal uh, wording of the conditions uh, in the DNO on this particular matter. And while the, the geo exploration, the road cutting for the boring seems to be somewhat of a preliminary uh, phase of the entire grading, um, we, we regret the, again, the inconvenience for the delay, but um, we, in our own mind, we could not, even for that minor amount of grading, we could not could not in good good faith um, issue any grading permits until that was till those items were completed to our satisfaction. Just want to go on the record with that. Thank you very much for that. So, uh, does that conclude your remarks, uh, County? Yes. Yes. Great, Thank Commissioner. You. Commissioners, do you have any questions for the county? Chair, this is Gary Okuda, if I may. Please proceed, Mr. Okuda. Uh, thank you, Chair. This is more a statement uh, as follow up to the statement that was just made by uh, DPP. Um, uh, we all regret delays that take place in development. However, um, I, I don't want my silence or lack of questions to be taken as any criticism of DPP because we are clearly dealing with property which previously was in the conservation district, which creates a higher standard of care in my view, together with the fact that there's documented Hawaiian cultural resources um, and, and resources, landmarks, a heiau, uh, endangered species. So a higher level or more careful level of scrutiny and, and being careful and taking the time while it may lead to a delay under these circumstances, I do not believe what DPP has done or required is unreasonable. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Kuda. Other commissioners, any comments or questions for the county? Uh, seeing none, uh, the chair would like to also add its uh, perspective, commending uh, the county for taking it seriously. And, and making sure it's done in proper order with all the um, detail that you did. So thank you. Okay, we will now proceed to uh, Office of Planning and Sustainable Development. Mr. Yi, do you have any remarks or presentation on the matter today? OPSD has no comments uh, or remarks. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Hearing none, I would presume we don't have any questions on Mr. Yee's no, no remarks. Is that, and I don't ever want to give the commissioners take away an opportunity to question Mr. Yee if they so like, so. Chair, this is Gary Okuda. I'm really sorry, but I have a question for Mr. Yee. <laughs> I'm actually happy you do, Mr. Okuda. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, uh, Mr. Yee, um, you heard Mr. Tabata's uh, explanation and argument with respect to the applicability of the statute of frauds or the non-applicability. In other words, that um, there's really no need to have the parent company sign off on a, on a personal guarantee here. Um, do you agree with that analysis or are you, or do you feel like you can't really comment on that right now? I think the statute of frauds argument relates to the question of whether you believe the document is a binding uh, contract uh, between SCI and another party. Uh, I don't think it's relevant because I don't think the, uh, the LUC requirement was asked for that. That's for a commitment. The commitment then is simply a, a, a something from SCI to the LUC. I don't think the LUC was looking for a contract between the LUC and an SCI. It was looking for a reassurance, uh, and I think that was adequately supplied by the letter. So actually, I think the statute of frauds question is actually irrelevant to your analysis. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I understand your position, uh, but in the transcript, I did ask during the hearing 
will SCI personally guarantee the obligations of Hawaii Memorial Park? And the answer was yes. So it was something specific, but I ended, I just wanted to get your input on uh, the commentary. Th thank you very much, Mr. E. Appreciate your input. Thank you. Commissioners, any further questions or follow up for Mr. E? Uh, hearing none, we'll proceed to the intervener. So intervener, uh, Mr. Yoshimori, do you have any uh, remarks or presentation for the commission today? Oh, we do, thank you. Um, I, I guess what's key for us is that we really would like to request that we get to see the grading plan and the detention analysis when it's completed. And um, we hope for continued timely communication of progress status. And, and we really wanted to thank the commission for calling this hearing because it really helped us get informed on the status of the development. And we also wanted to thank HMP for the comprehensive status. It was a really good update. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Mr. Moshe Murray. Commissioner, is there any questions for intervener? Commissioner Cabral. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I want to thank the interveners for in this hearing because of, I was in the hearing several years ago, did the tour, I was pre, pre pandemic, you know, getting informed about this. And um, I, I really want to say that I think because of your input, and the questions throughout all of these hearings that um, a lot of protection and a lot more thought has gone into some of our decision making. And I think that that's gonna be better overall for the general public as this project moves forward, including, I was thinking as um, the county indicated, yes, that the delays with being able to move forward are in part are because of the language we put into our stipulations, and I think that as much as it, I don't think that we realized that's what it was going to take, you know, not understanding understanding what grading and that the that what the was going to what it was going to take and the delays it could cause. But I think in the long run, we're all better for that because of the fact that in the past, I think our our um, land use language may not have been specific enough, and then therefore later on the public says, "How come you didn't?" take care of this? How come you didn't protect us? Because it, you know, we all thought we understood what we were talking about when in fact we don't, you know, the consequences of some of these general languages to make sure it's graded properly, to make sure it's permitted properly, those really have broad reaching effects. And so, and I think a lot of that has occurred because of your, your being the intervener and also the civic clubs and the participation of the community. So I wanted to personally thank you and for, for being a part of this and making sure that we we make the community better as the community is gonna grow, you know, instead of just having mistakes happen. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Other commissioners, any comments or questions for the intervener? Uh, seeing none, I do have a, uh, question, I it may go back to the DPP. Um, we heard the intervener ask for access to review or comment upon the final grading plan and the design of the retention basins. Are those documents, I presume those documents are part of what is reviewed by DPP when it's issuing its permits. Is that true? Um, question to county. Fritz. Um, yes. Are those when when they are do they become publicly available when um, that, what? if the yeah. petitioner in submitting for its permit provides the county copies of its final grading plan and its design of its retention basins is that do those documents become available to the public once the permits are issued they're public record so I think that ad would adequately uh, address the interest of the intervener. They would have access to those documents. It, intervener, does that ad does the timing of that adequately uh, address your your interest? Um, we were actually hoping we could see it prior to um, the the release of the decision or the permit. So we wanted to see it when it was filed with the DTP. We, we were hoping we would get access to it at that time. So we could comment on, 
if it did comply with the 10 year, 24 hour rain event, we wanted to make sure that we wanted to ask our um, expert to review them and, and make sure that um, it is compliant with that requirement. So let me go back now to petitioner. Petitioner, would you have any, um, would you agree to provide copies of those, of the uh, final grading plan and the retention basin plan when they are completed and submitted to the, the, the county in support of an application for permit? Would you agree to make those available uh, contemporaneously, same time uh, to the intervener and to this commission? So long as the plans are final, um, there may not be a problem with that request. I need to consult with my client and the engineers. This is this is our engineers' work product, um, so um, they do have a say in this process. Um, but the, uh, what we generally avoid doing is releasing draft information. Uh, those are work in progress, incomplete. Um, so um, there's a big difference between a draft plan and a final plan. Uh, just as you know, uh, we lawyers don't like to send out drafts of our briefs to the public. Um, we consider the requests and. Uh, with people involved. So I, think you said, I think you said two things. One is that you had no problem sending out finals, but you also said you wanted to consult with your engineers. So are you qualifying? I'm sorry. We're willing to consider the request for the final plan for it to come from us. Um, and that's what we're agreeable to do. We, we are agreeable to consider the request, um, especially if it's public record at that point in time. Yeah, I think what we're all, all trying to get to, and I, I share the interest of the intervener, is that if for some reason, you know, there's an oversight or an error that can be found, we want to find it early, not after the fact. And not that we want to, have third parties second guessing designs and approaches of the details. But just this is, if you recall, this is a design that is unique in that we've required this criterion for the, the more comprehensive rain event. And it's not normally been designed to this level of consideration. So, and it was a very important aspect of the overall. Uh, DNO was that, that that condition, I think I forget the number of the condition, five, I believe. So um, I don't think we're in a position today to make a uh, specific, at least not this point in time, to make a specific, um, let me put it in the form of a request by the commission. So Mr. Tabata, as you proceed, um, as you proceed forward with this project, with the geotechnical boring leading to the final grading plan and the final retention basin plan, let me encourage you and your clients to share that information um, with those involved in this petition and, and hearing before the LUC for the purposes of, of getting it right, that we don't want any mistakes to be made here. And we're not trying to change the criterion uh, for these for, or criteria for these plans, but but they're so darn important, we wanna make sure they're done right. And we do, we do, we are sympathetic to the interests of the intervener who live in houses right below this project. And we don't wanna get it wrong. So let me just ask you, when you take that into consideration, that you take it very serious. Yes, Chair, we understand the request and we do take it seriously. We do. Okay. I'm going to leave it at that for today.
So um, we'll get my. So we're at the point now. So that I presume. So with that final commissioners, do we have any final comments or questions for the intervener? Um, Mr. Chair, this is Commissioner Chang. Um, Please proceed. A, thank you. I just wanted to make a comment on the last line of questioning. Um, and I and I realize, Mr. Sabata, that uh, Chair Giovanni has made a request. And I know you guys are obviously taking every condition extremely seriously. Um, you know, I think what we've found is being more proactive, getting the key players at the table early on. I think um, so. I too would encourage, to the extent that you could, your engineers could possibly meet with the interveners and their their experts. At the end of the day, it is ultimately your engineers' decision because liability will fall on your engineers. And I think the interveners would be very cautious about. You know, well, I mean, I think they want to participate. They want to see what you're proposing. And I think we would all agree it's better to have them participate beforehand to avoid any delays and opposition. So I would just encourage you, and like I said, I have seen your presentation today as reaffirm um, Hawaii Memorial's part to fully comply with all the conditions in a very genuine way. So I am optimistic that you will find working with the interveners, especially on this matter, given where they reside and um, how important this is to them, to consider working with them early on. I realize um, rather than at the final, but perhaps before you submit to DPP, I suspect DPP would appreciate if in your applications, you mentioned that you met with the interveners. That would facilitate BPP's review. I that's my suspicion. So that's my only. Um, I just echo and encourage, based upon Chair Giovanni's request, but um, this uh, collaboration with Hawaii Memorial Park really seems to be um, committed to. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Chair, this is Gary Okuda, if I may. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, this Chair, this is a follow-up to your comment and to Commissioner Chang's comment. Uh, I, I actually do agree with what I think is Mr. Tabata's analysis, that they're really, from a strict legal standpoint, not uh, there is no strict requirement that that uh, non-public, non-final documentation or plans be released. However, I join in the urgings of the chair and Commissioner Chang, because you know uh, the flip side of the strict legal analysis is okay, interveners. You, you, we don't have to show you anything and we'll just file, you know, and, and get our permit. Well, because the rules regarding standing is really broad, which allows citizens in the community to file lawsuits to enforce environmental laws, the inter interveners at that point, if they believe that there was non-compliance with a condition, could bring an action and that action itself can create further delays and and roadblocks and frankly, just a whole bunch of us lawyers getting involved on, in useless activities in the big picture. So I would join in uh, the chair and the other commissioners request that we, we try to do things which, uh, um, I'm not saying violate the law because we gotta follow the law very strictly, but do things in, in a way so that we can minimize uh, um, disputes which might be able to be avoided. Um, you know, we're here to hear whatever the disputes really are, but if it's possible to avoid it, to get the job done, then I think we should look at getting the job done in a way consistent with the law. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Kuda, for your comments. Sure. I have a question. This is Lee Ohigashi. Commissioner Ohigashi, please proceed. And that goes, my question is, Sort of along this line, but my question is related to DPP. Is the standard of review to issue grading permits 
That includes a review of your department as to the engineering work done by the petitioner as well, and to ensure that they meet the standards that are contained within the DNO issue in this matter. Um, this is Dina with the DPP. So our grading permits get reviewed by our site development division, and they're looking at it for compliance with, um, I guess, all the grading requirements of the county. Um, looking at the conditions of the DNO is is something that um, DPP does um, overall, not not just only on that grading permit. So my question would be is when they apply for the grading permit, will DPP review it in light of the DNO decision? Yes. Okay. Uh, and that makes me conclude that whatever Mr. Tabata decides, that the main agency that is involved in making sure that the grading permit addresses the concerns that were in the DNO is your department, the DPP. And that it would behoove maybe the interveners to work with your department also to enlighten and maybe educate your department as to what their concerns with the DNO. Uh, the, as I see it, our our statements made here, statements made here by individual commissions were encouragements, but not requirements contained in the DNO. And your agency being the, the end agency, the one that is actually responsible, maybe should be the one that would take into heart the intervener's concerns and educate themselves as to what their concerns. That's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, I think what we are, uh, myself and, and several of our commissions are trying to express, if I may summarize, is that we would all be uh, hardened by, an, uh, by continued serious consideration by DPP as it proceeds including uh, a comprehensive review of these plans. And we've encouraged you to include in that review uh, a means for addressing the concerns of the intervener who has played a very important role in this whole process as Commissioner Cabral has pointed out to uh, make it a better and more successful project. Okay. We're going to move forward and to a second round of public testimony. So uh, are there any members of the public, including uh, members that maybe have a particular interest in cultural matters that were discussed earlier today, who wish to testify at this point in time on the status and progress and what you've heard here today to date uh, on the their plans? If so, please raise your hand or if you are uh, in the room and if you are using Zoom software, use the star nine function to uh, be recognized. So Ms. Kwan, is there anyone that would like to provide public testimony? Hi, Mr. Chair, we have one person in the audience interested in giving testimony today. Uh, can you uh, admit that person to the panel and we'll recognize them? Okay, aloha chair and commissioners. Uh, my name is Laura Ka'akua. I'm the CEO for Hawaii Land Trust. Uh, nice to be with you all again. Um, at Commissioner Chang's encouragement, and being followed by the chair's encouragement, I just wanted to come forward 
um, mainly if there's any questions uh, from commissioners regarding the conservation easement. Um, I know that there are some new members of this commission, and so maybe just to provide a little bit of, of background um, on conservation easements and our role uh, in this project. Um, Hawaii Land Trust is a nonprofit uh, that works on all islands to protect and steward land and connect people to that land. Um, and we work in two ways to protect land. Either we purchase the land for conservation and steward it uh, with community in that area, or we acquire conservation easements that restrict privately owned land. And so we um, did not participate in the hearings of this commission and did not take a position um, on the proposed expansion of the cemetery. We're not an advocacy organization, so we only work with um, willing landowners that um, are open to conservation of, of their lands. And so um, after this commission um, put forward its decision and order, that's really when we got involved for the first time and uh, reviewed the decision and order and were asked by Hawaiian Memorial Park if we would be willing to hold a conservation easement um, over the property. And uh, I think we are probably responsible for a lot of the delay in that um, we, uh, one, we had to get up to speed. Um, and then secondly, we used the Land Use Commission's decision and order as sort of our starting point and baseline for the terms of the conservation easement. Um, but for us, um, this conservation easement was our 49th conservation easement that we own um, and, and monitor annually. Uh, that's uh, the role of the conservation easement holder is to monitor properties regularly uh, and see if the, all of the terms of the conservation easement are being followed uh, by the landowner and then take any um, steps to intervene and enforce if there's a violation of the conservation easement terms. And so we um, used the, the decision and order as that really that starting point. Um, and then we wanted to uh, add in our own lessons learned over the years. We wanted to ensure that there was proper oversight. We pushed for additional requirements um, such as um, native plants, if there's areas that are disturbed, um, we wanted to expand that. So there was some language that was already encouraged by the commission that we wanted to um, see more of in, in the, the final conservation easement terms. Uh, and so um, I guess that's it's maybe relevant to the timeline. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, commissioners, questions for the witness? Um, Mr. Chair, this is Commissioner Chang. Please proceed. Aloha, Lawrence. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh -huh. um, I just wanted to clear, confirm the role of Ko'olau Foundation and the role of the Ko'olau Oko Hawaiian Civic Club in the conservation community. Sure. So um, the parties to the conservation easement are Hawaii Memorial Park and um, Hawaii Land Trust. Um, the conservation easement puts the requirement on Hawaii Memorial Park to take a number of follow-up actions, such as establishing the cultural preserve. Um, we acknowledge in the conservation easement that um, Ko'olau Foundation and Ko'olau Hawaiian Civic Club will have uh, roles. Um, we acknowledge that Hawaiian Memorial Park has, has um, a requirement and intention to work with the community groups um, to establish the cultural preserve and create a management plan and um, do everything that uh, the decision and order required. Um, but the conservation easement itself does not place 
particular obligations on Ko'olau Hopeful Hawaiian Civic Club or, or Ko'olau Foundation. And I appreciate the clarification. So while Ko'olau Foundation or Ko'olau Hopeful Hawaiian Civic Club are not parties to the conservation commitment, were they part of the discussions with um, Hawaiian Land Trust and Hawaiian Memorial Park in establishing the conservation easement? No, because we didn't go into specifics on the cultural preserve. And so the cultural preserve is really, I think we're all in agreement that, um, you know, the, the vision, the direction, um, what the community wants to happen there really falls into the court of um, Hawaiian, uh, sorry, Ko'olau Poko, Hawaiian Service Club and Ko'olau Foundation. And so we just didn't think it was appropriate to put any of those terms in because that's really um, theirs to decide and uh, to be decided. And of course the preservation plan that they uh, mentioned as well as a management plan that will come later. Um, so let me understand. So um, once Ko'olau Foundation and Ko'olau Poco Hawaiian Civic Club um, developed the cultural preservation plan and the cultural preserve, will that now become incumbent upon Hawaiian Land Trust to ensure that that plan is implemented um, and followed through by Hawaiian Memorial Park? Um, just in the broad terms, right? So the conservation easement speaks broadly about the requirement of the cultural preserve, um, but doesn't go into detail. And so the, uh, I imagine that the following plans um, will go into a lot of detail. And so we won't take it a step down and, and look at that plan. We're gonna stick to the exact language of the conservation easement to make sure that all of those terms are followed. So I guess I'm kind of seeing it in this really complicated project is like the um, the decision and order uh, is our sort of the, the foundation. And then our conservation easement adds an addition or um, incorporates all of the requirements pertaining to the conservation easement and then adds an additional level of, um, I guess, land use restriction that Hawaiian Memorial Park needs to follow. And then sort of layered onto that might be um, any further plans that Hawaiian Memorial Park develops with um, Ko'olau Poco Hawaiian Civic Club and uh, Ko'olau Foundation. I know it does, um, it does appear to be a very kind of complicated um, relationship because I understand that the role of the, um, the trust the land trust is to monitor um, compliance with the conservation easement but the details of the conservation easement specifically the cultural preserve hasn't been fully vetted out and that's where the Kuliana of Ko'olau Foundation and Ko'olau Poco Hawaii Civic Club I guess I'm looking at um, I think you, you've heard some of the concerns by the commissions about um, not necessarily enforcement, but how to ensure that the cultural preservation uh, plan and the role of the civic club and the foundation are fully committed to. So who does the Koala Poco Point Civic Club or Koala Foundation if they're concerned that there's not a commitment. Do they come and see the land trust? Do they come to see one Memorial Park? Do they come to see the land use commission? I mean, who who enforces the conditions of the cultural preservation? Yeah, well, uh, anyone back here, you feel free to correct me if I'm speaking out of turn. Uh, but I would say. Um, you know, they should absolutely come and, and talk to Hawaiian Memorial Park if they feel like there's there's uh, some something that's um, not in alignment with what's been previously committed to. They absolutely can come to us. So we do have, um, I would say, 
the cultural preserve is is a requirement. Um, and so if there's I, I you know don't anticipate this will happen, but if there's no progress on and there's no cultural preserve, it's a, it's a, just hasn't happened for whatever reason. It, it would rise to the level of at least an inquiry for, for Hawaii land trust. Um, you know, whether it's not, a, we would look at the exact language of the conservation easement, but we would absolutely get involved in, and um, the cultural preserve um, is part of, it's part of the terms of the conservation easement. And so it's part of our annual monitoring that we'll be doing, which is, uh, you know, we've, physically will be on site every year. Um, because there's different components of the conservation easement, including the cultural preserve, uh, we anticipate that what will happen on the ground is that we'll um, prepare for the visit and we would have, you know, we would invite uh, someone from Hawaii Memorial Park, we would invite someone from Ko'olau Poko Hawaiian Civic Club and Ko'olau Foundation and just sort of annually monitor the land together um, so that we can get information for our own purposes in um, creating our annual monitoring report, which we do as part of our, our um, own processes. It, I mean, for me, sitting as a land use commission, um, I look to you, your organization, as having the expertise. This is your 49th um, and my preference is that, and I'm extremely optimistic that Koala Poco Hawaiian City Club, Koala Foundation, and Hawaii Memorial Park have already demonstrated a relationship and a commitment to work together. But that rather than elevating anything to LUC, that there is that there is um, a mechanism with um, intervention or at least the collaboration with the land trust to address any concerns that they may have in the implementation. And so um, that raises my level of comfort through this conservation easement that there is this, um, that you have a, you, that the land trust has, it has a quality assurance that these standards are going to be met and the fact that you put it, you included some additional requirements beyond what the LUC put on, um, again, raises my assurance and comfort that this is going to be implemented in a timely and as intended by the parties. So I'm satisfied by this relationship. I think um, it does in some way insulate the Land Use Commission that we don't have to be, you know, become the, the where someone, at least for the culture preserve, they come to us for enforcement, but they have your organization who has expertise to assist in the monitoring implementation, as well as your own expertise on how to manage culture preserve. So, okay, I'm satisfied with your responses. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Chang, and thank you for your responses. Any other commissioner have a question or a comment for this witness? Seeing none, I'd like to thank you again for coming forward with your public testimony. Yeah. Ms. Kwan, is there any other party wishing to testify at this time? Can you please say state your name and your address or your affiliation and proceed I'm, with I'm, I'm, I'm a resident of Mahe Yakea, the local of Kola Poko. Um, I'm also a, a 47 066 Kamehameha Highway, um, 97 and um, 
I am uh, president of Coral Foundation, and um, I'm here to uh, bear testimony on uh, the appreciation um, that uh, we uh, can come before you, the uh, Land Use Commission, and to uh, address uh, the, the issue of, well, it's not an issue, but it's a wonderful opportunity that we are being given this uh, um, uh, kuleana to participate in um, the preservation of um, the, the area of uh, Kawaiwai, which is a of which this particular part of the property that is being owned and uh, managed um, by Hawaii Memorial Park has um, allowed us to come forward and participate with them in creating uh, a preservation of this particular ili. Um, the ili is, uh, is uh, situated um, near the, the, the hills of Kapa and um, has a, a lot of um, iconic historical, um, uh, what do you call, uh, places of, 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 of Hawaiian history, which uh, date back thousands of years. Uh, during the time of Olopana, who was the chief, the ruling chief of Oahu. And um, the, uh, the uh, foliage that surrounds that particular Kabaevae, uh, a hill, is um, the, uh, a wellspring of, of, uh, of native plants, which uh, we want to restore and to preserve. And so we are, we are elated um, by Hawaii Memorial Park for their invitation to participate with them in this preservation um, uh, feat of responsibility. And so we want to just thank the commission for inviting us to come share our, our, uh, our manao on this particular area and um, about how you are for your questions, which um, has brought some things to our mind as we've been planning and talking about how our participation uh, will again uh, bring back to our Hawaiian people a uh, an education, a, uh, a reference to uh, the, the pride of our people as Hawaiians, and when they when they, when these areas of historical significance were in operation, and uh, this has been our purpose as Kola Foundation. Uh, we offer um, the voice of, of our kupa Aina, those that are born and raised and have functioned in Ko'olau Poko for centuries. Um, many of the members of our foundation have generational ties to Ko'olau Poko dating back well over 400 years. And so, this is, uh, we find this is a wonderful opportunity for, for a reestablishment of that awareness of our Hawaiian culture and the meaning of those Wahitana, as we say in Hawaii, uh, can bring further significance to our people up there and our families up there. Mahalo. Mahalo. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions for the witness? Commissioner Okuda. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for getting involved in, in this project and in the goals that have been set out. You probably heard my questions and everybody can interpret on their own what the Land Use Commission order and conditions say. It's my personal view and I believe it's the view of, uh, of the law that our conditions have essentially the force of law. And my recollection of the hearings is that one of the reasons why the Land Use Commission was willing to go forward and have this boundary amendment changing conservation to urban, which is going to in include or involve 
um, some significant grading of the and and uh, tearing down of parts of the Oneyaba Hills is this trade off that there was going to be a commitment for preservation of these cultural resources and the things that you spoke about. So I would really, I, I really, really thank you on behalf of everyone that you're willing to take on this really important responsibility. At the same time, I hope that you heard the assurance that we intend to, to um, enforce the conditions that have been set forth in our land use order. And one of the conditions are that your reasonable expenses are supposed to be paid because there are many, many good ideas that we all have, but these ideas never take place if there's no money. So this is an opportunity, I believe, to actually implement something to preserve things for future generations. Um, you know, I'm not Native Hawaiian, but I grew up on the windward side. I know personally what it means to lose uh, Hawaiian cultural resources. You know, we regret a lot of stuff that happened in the past, but that should be a lesson about what we've got to do in the future. So your reasonable expenses under the order are supposed to be paid for by Hawaiian Memorial Park. If you believe that you should have certain expertise to give you assistance, uh, you heard the statements by Hawaiian Memorial Park's attorney about retention by you of the attorney of your choice to make sure you're protected in whatever you do. So again, I, I thank you for what you're doing. I think everyone thanks you. And please, please take advantage of uh, the support that the order and the conditions that we've placed in there give to the people who are providing this protection to these important cultural and historic resources. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mahalo Nui, Commissioner Okuda, for that uh, foresight and that uh, confidence. Um, you know, we, you know, we work with nothing. You know, we work with just our own, our own resources. And um, when the, uh, a landowner is so willing to come forward to include us, this is such a wonderful opportunity. But that, but that um, council is uh, well taken. Mahalo. Mahalo, and thank you, Commissioner Okuda. I think your remarks reflect those of feelings of many of our commissioners. Um, Chair, uh, Commissioner Chang, Commissioner yes. Chang, would you like to, would you like to speak? I would. <laughs> Please proceed. I know, I know where we are. Uh, let me just make a comment time-wise. I know we've been going about an hour and 20 minutes, but I would like to complete the public testimony and the questions for the public testifiers. So please proceed. Thank you very much. Aloha, Aaron. Very good to see you on that side of the table and not on this side of the table. So <laughs> mahalo for being here this morning. Um, you know, um, Koala Foundation, you have given unselfishly, unconditionally to preserve many of the resources in our community. I mean, I, I know Mahalani is out there literally, um, and, and it is, you operate on a shoestring budget. I am encouraged by this project because there is a, you have a partnership. And Aaron, I like the way that you presented this, an opportunity, an invitation. Um, you know, Hawaiians, we're not Mahaoi. We're not going in somebody else's property without an invitation, right? That's not mm -hmm. what we do. So I appreciate the way that you, the spirit that you are coming into this. Um, but as Commissioner Okuda said, you have this opportunity, because this is a shared kuleana. Hawaii Memorial Park as a landowner understands that um, you bring value to this process. You bring manao, you bring expertise. You also bring a family connection to this area. You, you, know, you are connected to this place. So um, you should, um, you know, it is, how do I say? 
Um, this partnership, the, the contribution, Hawaii Memorial Park is making a financial contribution of money and men. You are bringing the value of your own expertise, your ohana, the community. It's equal value. Not one is more than the other. So please, um, you know, take that very seriously because I know the quality of work that you do. So I would like to ask you, are you comfortable with, and I know I was just talking to Laura, this is a very complicated kind of relationship that you all have, but I appreciated the um, Trust for Public Land stepping up. Are you comfortable with where you are right now in this process? And are you comfortable with the relationship, you know, Twine Memorial Park and the Trust for Public, uh, the Land Trust, in moving forward on developing the, the cultural preserve? I can honestly say um, at this point in time, uh, we've started our, um, our uh, discussions and um, have, 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 I've already signed off on, on several agreements, but at this point, I feel very comfortable that we were stepping off. Um, I, would, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Mahilani Cypher, who is also a member of our our Koala Foundation to um, attest to this. Thank you. Might be able to speak. Mr. Chair, uh, can Mahalani also make contributions to the discussion? Could you say that again, please? Um, uh, um, Aaron had asked that Mahalani Cypher, who's also a member of Koala Foundation, um, contribute to this discussion at this time. If she's so willing, we will admit her as a public testifier. Please state your name and affiliation. Hello, Mike Kako. Uh, my name is Mahalani Cypher. I am a um, member of the board of Koala Foundation and a past president as of the, at the Alice of the Koala Poka Hawaiian City Club. So I can um, speak to the history and the, I guess the feeling, the mana'o of our members of both organizations. Oh, great. Please proceed. I, I agree with um, Aaron that this has been very interesting. And before I go any further, both our organizations would like to express our sincere appreciation to all of you, to the commissioners, to the interveners, to the Hawaii Memorial Park and everyone else who has worked with us. Um, they have been nothing but aloha shown us and we are grateful because in the beginning, and this was 10 or 15 years ago, our club, Civic Club debated over whether to support the um, objectives of Hawaii Memorial Park. And after much debate, they finally decided to support it after they were assured that the um, drainage would be addressed so that the community would be safe. That was an assurance we got from planning and permitting. Um, and we were also made aware that they canceled the other subdivision they were planning next to Pohainani. So then when they committed to doing the culture preserve for Kavai Vai, um, that's what made our club more supportive. And so we have been supporting it ever since. And it wasn't for the financial part. Our Kuliana is more towards the spiritual part, the, the part that it's a Vai, vai couple. It's important to our people, past and future. And so out of respect for the Vai couple, we feel called to do this work, whether we're paid or not. Mahalo. Thank you, Ms. Seifert. I appreciate your testimony. Commissioners, any comments or questions for this witness? Mr. Chair, this is Commissioner Chang. Um, I would just like to mahalo um, Ko'ola Foundation, the Ko'ola Poko Hawaiian Civic Club for stepping up and accepting this kuleana. Yeah, it comes both ways. It is responsibility and burden. Yeah, and, truly. And as Commissioner Okuda said, to a large extent, I think um, many of the commissioners were swayed by the fact that um, the foundation and the Civic Club supported this project. The reputation and your own commitment, I think that was very critical to many of us. So we thank you. And we also, I, 
I know you guys well enough. You, if something's not right, you're going to say something and you'll do something. But I also have seen from Hawaii Memorial Park a willingness to have this, this partnership and this collaboration. Um, and I, I, I am really optimistic um, that this once covered cultural resource is now going to be shown in its glory with all of the interpretation and that the community is going to really get to enjoy and appreciate um, its stature in the Hawaiian community. So mahalo to all of you. Thank you very much. Mahalo. Mahalo, thank you uh, very much. I'd like to return to the uh, petitioner. Petitioner, we've had a fair amount of testimony since you made your, your presentation. Uh, do you have any further comments that you'd like to make at this time? Thank you, Chair. Um, Yes, we just like to say, um, questions. Thank you for um, interviewers' input, um, public testimony. Um, this is a complicated project, um, and we're we're moving forward, doing our best, um, and we hope to take the comments and guidance that we received today, and to make a uh, more comprehensive annual report um, and address um, concerns that, uh, that we've heard today. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tabata. Appreciate your comments. And let me also comment, you know, going back to our last hearing, it was the first time we had two rounds of public testimony and we were saying, just kind of scratching our head about the potential value of such. And I think today's hearing really showed the value of two rounds of public testimony at a, at a complicated hearing. So it worked in my view. I just wanna put that on the record. Um, so looking at the time, it's 11.52. Um, where we need to go from here is a further discussion by the commission. So let me, ask the commission for its um, preferences. Would you, I'll give you a choice. Would you like to plow through and do a, our discussion and potential deliberation now, or would you like to take a 45 minute lunch break? Now, now. Is it the consensus of, of, the, of the commissioners there in the room that we keep going right now? Yes. This is yes any, is. any commissioner object to that or need a short bio break? Okay, hearing none, we're going to proceed. Um, uh, I, can we turn the air conditioner down a little bit? I'm beginning to freeze. <laughs> Chair, uh, uh, this is Gary Okuda. I'd like to make a motion. One second, Commissioner. Um, I need to make some comments first. Uh, Commissioner, this is a status report. We're not required to take any action at this time. If no action is taken, the requirement of continued annual reports will remain the same. We've also heard the commitment today of the petitioner that the forthcoming annual re status report will be more comprehensive than what we saw last year. However, if the commission feels that its concerns have not been addressed based on the comments and responses provided by the petitioner, the chair will entertain a motion that either the petitioner's status report has not sufficiently addressed the commission's concerns and that further meetings or status updates are necessary to provide the opportunity to do so at a future date to be determined by the LUC staff. Or thirdly, if there's a reason to believe that the petitioner will not adhere to the conditions set forth in the decision and order 
and re they may request the staff move forward with a formal order to show process for a show cause proceedings. At this point, I ask for the commissioners for further discussion and would entertain a motion. This is Gary Okuda. I would like to make a motion. Please proceed, Commissioner Okuda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that based on what's taking place today, no further action be taken with thanks to everyone for having come here today to bring us up to date on what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a second to Commissioner Okuda's motion? Yes, Commissioner Cabral, I'll second that motion. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Okuda, would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. For once, I really have nothing to add. <laughs> I think everything is so explanatory. Thank you. Commissioner Cabral, would you like to speak to your second? I'll second that motion. <laughs> that you have nothing to add. Okay. Um, commissioners, uh, do you have any comments that you'd like to make relative to the motion? Seeing none, um, I think we're ready to uh, act on the motion. So the motion has been made by Commissioner Okuda and seconded by Commissioner Cabral that no further action is required at this time. Um, if there is no further discussion, Mr. Orndanker, would you please poll the commission on the pending motion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the motion is to take no further action. Uh, Commissioner Okuda. Yes. Commissioner Cabral. Yes. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Kamakeo Hello. Aye. Commissioner um, Kahele is, is excused. <clears throat> Commissioner Ohigashi. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Yamani. Aye. Chair Giovanni. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The motion passes with seven affirmative votes. Thank you. Uh... Mr. Orndaker, and thank you, everyone involved. Thanks to all the parties and for your participation and presentations today. Thank you for our public testifiers. Very much appreciated. Uh, this concludes our meeting for today, uh, unless there's any further business to discuss. So does any commissioners have anything they want to bring up at this point in time? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh... Staff is wondering whether you want to seek approval for lunch at the next um, meeting on September 7th. Would you, would you clarify that question again? <laughs> well, I'm wondering whether you want, to, you want to request that lunch be brought in at the September 7th meeting due to its location in Hilo. That's the one in Hilo? Yeah, sure. What do you recommend, Commissioner Cabral? <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm going to be on the mainland. Otherwise, I'd bring you a nice steak lunch. But, um, but yeah, you know, you might want to because when I, I we could check and see that the university is open of our hearings at UH Hilo, and they do have a nice um, cafeteria and food service there. So I would probably recommend you just try and do a sandwich or bring it up from there because that would be the most convenient and not require driving in that because her food is quite good. I had a large event there last week. So that would be I'd recommend. I think that's a great recommendation. So uh, Mr. Rundaker, can you research if the cafeteria will be open and whether we would have access to that on the UH Hilo campus? And let's proceed uh, with that. Mr. Chair, this is Leo Higashi. I think that in the event that that is not possible. We should have a motion or a statement on the record indicating that because of its location uh, that we will be providing lunch. Can I ask Commissioner that you make that motion that you're suggesting? I, we I have? don't think it's a motion. I think it's a, a comment by the, yeah. by the chair. Okay, <laughs> if I can do it, then Mr. Orndanker, the chair would like you to have lunch provided uh, on premises 
for our hearing on September 7. Your options include access to or food to be provided by the on-site cafeteria and in the absence of that, make other arrangements for it to be brought in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You Thank so. I, Mr. Chair, I have one comment before we leave today. I think- Does it, uh, have, any, does it have anything to do with baseball? Yes, it does. <laughs> I'd like to announce that the Honolulu, uh, Texas uh, 13-0 and one <laughs> I think that I think that's really important, and and let me tell you the extra reason why, and and actually the reason why I'm not in Honolulu today with you, is I have a once in a lifetime opportunity to see my 12 year old grandson play in Cooperstown in a baseball championship series of 48 teams, and I'm just thrilled to be here instead of with you. So that it's all about baseball. Okay, no further business. I'll see you on September 7th. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Aloha. Yeah.